uh, double thank you for joining us this evening and uh, we're delighted to welcome Tracy Chevalier and Claire Chambers to this historical research and writing event as part of the Wantage Literary Festival online. My name's Nicola Cornick. I'm a historian and the author of dual time novels that are set between the 15th and the 18th century. Um, my most recent book, The Forgotten Sister, is currently on sale in the UK and with amazing timing, it was published in North America yesterday. Uh, although I think that this particular event may have been slightly eclipsed by something else that's also going on in the US at the moment. Uh, it's my very great pleasure to, uh, to be invited to chat with Claire and Tracy this evening. Uh, the format for the talk is that we will discuss um, some common themes in the books and also talk more generally about writing historical fiction. At the end, there will be the opportunity for questions. So when we get to that point, if you would like to ask a question, please click on the uh, little hand. I think it's the... Um, the, the um, the hand waving icon uh, and we'll come to you um, to uh, unmute you so that you can ask your questions. Um, I'd like to start uh, by asking Claire and Tracy to introduce themselves um, and to read a short passage uh, from the book from from their book. Um, Claire would you like to would you like to start? Okay um, my name is Claire Chambers I'm the author of nine novels two of which are for young adults um, my most recent novel was published this summer, it's called Small Pleasures, and it's my first uh, foray into what I, I would call historical fiction. Uh, my previous novels were all contemporary um, at the time of writing, um, so it, it was a bit of a new departure for me. Um, I'll, I'll just say a few words about it briefly. Uh, the idea of it came to me when I was listening to a um, uh, an interview on Women's Hour back in 2001 and I heard an interview with the um, journalist Audrey Whiting talking about this this case of a of a virgin birth that she'd investigated as a young reporter um, and the Sunday pictorial which was the forerunner of the Sunday mirror had run a sort of competition to try and find a virgin mother because there, there'd been some new sort of research back then which had, had suggested that that perhaps parthenogenesis in in mammals was possible and they thought it might be fun to try and unearth a, a proper virgin mother sort of in time for the Christmas issue and uh, lots of women put themselves forward and were, were discounted and then they found this this one mother and daughter and uh, they were subjected to all sorts of tests and, and they the doctors couldn't really agree on whether or not they'd they disproved her claim and I, I was listening to this and I thought this sounds like a really good basis for a novel but I didn't do anything with it for, for quite some time um, I sort of let it kind of um, hang up in my mind for a few years and then I, I picked it up again a few years ago and started work on it and so so Small Pleasures is really a very a fictionalized account of very loosely based on this sort of seed of the idea of a, a woman who claims to be a virgin mother so my reading is, is right from the beginning so it doesn't really need any further ex explanation. The article that started it all was not even on the front page but was just a filler on page five, between an advertisement for the Patricia Brixey Dancing School and a report on the AGM of the Crofton North Liberals. It concerned the finding of a recent study into parthenogenesis in sea urchins, frogs and rabbits, which concluded that there was no reason it should not be possible in humans. This dusty paragraph might have been overlooked by most readers of the North Kent Echo, were it not for the melodramatic headline Men no longer needed for reproduction. The result was an unusually large post bag of mostly indignant letters, not just from men. One wounded correspondent, Mrs. Beryl Diplock of St. Paul's Cray, deplored the article's sentiments as dangerous and unchristian. More than one female reader pointed out that such a proposition was liable to give slippery men an excuse to wriggle out of their responsibilities. There was one letter, however, that stood out from all the rest. It was from a Mrs. Gretchen Tilbury of Seven Burdett Road, Sidcup, and read simply, Dear Editor, I was interested to read your article, Men No Longer Needed for Reproduction, in last week's paper. I have always believed my own daughter, now 10, to have been born without the involvement of any man. 
If you would like to know more information, you may write to me at the above address. The next editorial meeting, usually a dull affair involving the planning and distribution of duties for the week and a post-mortem of the errors and oversights in the previous issue, was livelier than it had been for some time. Jean Swinney, features editor, columnist, dog's body, and the only woman at the table, glanced at the letter as it was passed around. The slanted handwriting, with its strange continental loops, reminded her of a French teacher from school. She too had written the number seven with a line through it, which the 13-year-old Jean had thought the height of sophistication and decided to imitate. Her mother had put a stop to that. She could hardly have been more affronted if Jean had taken to writing in blood. <laughs> to Mrs Swinney, all <laughs> foreigners were Germans and beyond the pale. Thoughts of her mother prompted Jean to remember that she needed to pick up her shoes from the menders on the way home. It mystified her why someone who seldom left the house should need so many pairs of outdoor shoes. Also required were cigarettes, peppermint oil from Rumsey's, and kidneys and lard if she could be bothered to make a pie for dinner. Otherwise, it would just be eggs anyhow, that old standby. Does anyone want to go and interview our lady of Sidcup? asked Larry, the news editor. There was a general creaking back in chairs, indicative of dissent. Not really my thing, said Bill, sports and entertainment editor. Jean slowly extended her hand to take the letter. She knew it was coming her way sooner or later. Good idea, said Larry, huffing smoke across the table. It's women's interest after all. <laughs> Thank you very much, Claire. That's fantastic. Absolutely wonderful. Um, Tracy, shall we? Yeah, shall we, we? We come to you now. Sure. Um, I'm Tracy Chevalier. I've written ten novels, mostly historical, and I'm working on my eleventh. And we're talking tonight about a single thread. Um, which is a novel set in Winchester Cathedral. Uh, I've always wanted to write a cathedral novel because it's one of my favorite places. I love cathedrals. Um, and uh, I chose Winchester um, because it had a lot of stories attached to it, which I went to have a look at and research. And I discovered um, when I was walking around these cushions and kneelers that were uh, that are in place in the choir of uh, Winchester Cathedral and um, were embroidered, they're very colorful, and they were embroidered in the 1930s by a volunteer group of women. And I think I was drawn to them because um, when you look around the cathedral you see carving and uh, amazing stained glass and the building is amazing and all of that stuff was made by men. But um, the one thing we know was made by women uh, were the cushions and kneelers um, made by this group. And I decided I'd set a novel um, based on that group. And I came up with a, with a hero, my heroine is named Violet Speedwell. And I, I took her, I, I plucked her from her, her mother. She lived with her mother in Southampton and I dropped her into Winchester to create a new life for herself. Um, she was what uh, uh, the papers at the time called a surplus woman, which was after World War I, in 1921, the census found that there were almost two million more men, women than men as a, as a result of the war. And uh, society was not really set up to deal with single women in, that, in those numbers. Uh, women were expected to marry and have children. And uh, so all, there were all these women who were not going to be doing that. What was to be done with them? They were seen as a societal problem. So given this, um, this rather unfortunate label, surplus woman. And I thought, I want to write about a surplus woman, woman who creates her own, successfully creates an independent life for herself. And um, uh, I just wanted to say too, when I, when I read the reviews of, of Claire's book, Small Pleasures, I was so amazed at some of the similarities between our two books, despite being set uh, 20 years apart. Um, and they have some slightly different, I don't have virgin birth in this one. Um, I have embroidery, <laughs> it's different, but uh, there, there are some similarities between Jean, uh, Claire's heroine and my heroine, Violet. And I think that they actually would have been good friends if they had met. Um, so I'm gonna read just a very brief section about 
Violet's attraction to Winchester Cathedral, what she likes about it so much. Because she goes in there quite a lot to, for solace and not religious solace, but just to look around. Whenever she walked through the front entrance below the Great West Window and into Winchester Cathedral, the long nave in front of her and the vast space above bounded by a stunning vaulted ceiling, Violet felt the whole weight of the 900 year bu old building hover over her. It was the only place built specifically for spiritual sustenance in which she felt she was indeed being spiritually fed. Not necessarily from the services, it was more the reverence for the place itself, for the knowledge of the many thousands of people who had come there throughout its history, looking for a place in which to be free to consider the big questions about life and death, rather than worrying about paying for the winter's coal or needing a new coat. She loved it for the more concrete things as well, for its colored windows and elegant arches and carvings, for its old pattern tiles, for the elaborate tombs of bishops and kings and noble families. Like most smaller services, Evensong was held in the choir. The choir boys with their scrubbed mischievous faces sat in one set of stall benches, the congregants in the other, with any overflow in the adjacent presbytery seats. Violet suspected Evensong was considered frivolous by churchgoers compared with Sunday morning services, but she preferred the lighter touch of music to the booming organ and the shorter, simpler sermon to the hectoring morning one. She did not pray or listen to the prayers. Prayers had died in the war alongside a nation full of young men. But when she sat in the choir stalls, she liked to study the carved oak arches overhead, decorated with leaves and flowers and animals and even a green man whose mustache turned into abundant foliage. Out of the corner of her eye, she could see the looming enormity of the nave. But sitting here with the boys' ethereal voices around her, she felt safe from the void that sometimes threatened to overwhelm her. Sometimes, quietly and unostentatiously, she cried. Well, thank you very much, uh, Tracy and, and Claire. Um, it's, it's very interesting, Tracy, that um, when you were just talking then, you um, referred to the, uh, the similarities between uh, Violet's story and, um, and, and Jean's. And I was really struck by that when I was reading the books as well. And actually, that was where I thought it would be um, interesting to start our discussion. Um, because despite the facts, as you, uh, as you mentioned, that the the stories that actually take place, genes in the 1950s and, and violets uh, between the wars. It does feel as though their situations have a great deal in common. Um, uh, so what, what do you feel uh, are the common themes in, in your two books? Who would like to take that one first? I'll, um, I'll, I'll take say, that. Just... Oh, I'll, oh, sorry, go ahead. Okay, I'll just say quickly and then you can um, fill in the gaps there. I would say that oh, the go ahead the Claire. main yeah. the um the main the main similarity that I observed on you know almost immediately on reading is obviously the sort of theme of um, the duty versus personal fulfillment and 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 the, the sort of predicament of being a, being a a single woman um, and having the sort of responsibility of being a carer for a for an older parent and in obviously in, in Tracy's book um, Violet has has relinquished that duty fairly early on and, and moved out and well she's 38 when she relinquishes it yeah, so she's yeah, not entirely <laughs> she, she has escaped she's escaped the clutches yes. and in mine she she is very much very much in in the clutches but it's it's a sort of it's a, the, the thematic idea of women of women just being being victims of frustrated potential. I think was the thing that that really um, resonated with me. And the, the difference in the generation, the thirties to the fifties, di things didn't seem to have changed that much for women. I think the changes, the social changes, were all still to come. Really, um, so so that they felt yeah. much closer in age than. Than would yes. have been the case between the fifties and the seventies, say. Yes, certainly to a, to a reader, I 
I had that that feeling I and mean, it was very struck by the fact that you both created monster mothers <laughs> in, in the book so I mean I think that's I think that's probably a fair description sort of ty tyrants at home um and and as you say Claire that that idea of of, of, of the duty that was assumed that that, that 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 these unmarried daughters would would be the ones to do to do that caring uh, but uh, Tracy I know you were you wanted to, to come in on on that that's, um, that's all right uh, yeah, yes. I um, I love the two mothers um really should meet uh, uh, <laughs> by Mrs. Speedwell and Jean's mom are are really cut from the same cloth um, there's a great they have great lines in passive aggressive manipulation and um, and making their daughters feel guilty, uh, no matter what they do. Uh, and they're, it, it's, um, but it was, it was painful. Um, I, I found it very painful researching what women, single women were, were like at that time, what their lives could be expected to be like, because really they were, um, higher education was not open to them particularly. I mean, some, a few women went to, uh, to university, but, but not many, it was not expected. And the, um, the, the careers that were open to them, teaching, nursing, um, uh, being a clerk, uh, being a reporter, which is what uh, uh, Jean was able to be. And, uh, and that's probably, maybe that was one difference between the 30s and the 50s. I'm not sure that were, were that many women reporters. So maybe that was one career that opened up a little bit. But for, for, uh, for Violet, there was very little that she could um, expect to do that was expected of her. So the, the paths down which she could go were really limited. And she's a, a typist. And when she was living with her parents, she could live off of that salary fine because she wasn't paying the rent and and uh, she and and her, you know, so it was it was more like pocket money. But once you have to live on that on uh, as a salary, it was way lower than what men uh, had. And and so there was uh, there was that feeling that really these were temporary jobs that a woman would do until she married, and then her husband would look after her uh, financially. And and that was um, very painful, I found it very painful to, to read about what it was like to be a woman at that time, a single woman trying to make it on your own because it, uh, Have we frozen? <laughs> I'm not sure. I'm not sure whether we've, uh, whether we, whether, whether we're frozen there. Um, have I still got you, Claire? Yeah, I think we, yeah, I'm still All oh, right, still okay. Fine. Yes, um, I'm not sure whether we're hoping Tracy will be able to come back again in a moment. Um, yes, I mean, I, I, I was very interesting what, what uh, Tracy was just saying uh, about that, um, the constraints that were on, uh, on, on single, single women and, um, and the lives that they could lead. Um, because um, I, I think Jean in particular, um, I'm just thinking about her um, her purpose in life. Um, it, she had a, she did have a job, but again, that that was kind of uh, that that was constrained, wasn't it? That the role that she had, um, and and she was totally at the beck and call of her of her mother as well. So, the, mm -hmm. it, oh, you're back, Tracy. That's wonderful. Uh, yes, good to see you. Yeah, we were just talking about this idea of the constraints uh, on the, because of the expectations um, of single women. Um, and I was going to kind of come on to this idea of, uh, of duty versus personal fulfillment. I mean, um, I, I, how much do you think that's changed uh, in the time between you, when you were writing and, and, well, it's what, the 50, 60, 70 years that, that, that that's um, that, that, uh, to, to the present. Do you think that there has been a huge shift in that or, or maybe not so much? Well, it's interesting because um, I thought, of course, the, there would be a shift. I mean, we've, we've got so much um, more freedom than we had. We have much more access to higher education and careers. You know, women can do most careers now that they want. And also, maybe most importantly, it's not expected that we are, that we have to marry. And, um, and that, you know, removing that expectation has, has really opened the world to women. But having said all that, 
I had a couple of readers have come to me, um, have said to me after reading the book that they were, um, the, who are uh, readers who are single have said, you know, it's not so very different. Um, uh, in one scene in a single thread, Violet is sitting with the uh, embroidery group, which is made up primarily of married women. And she notes that the unmarried women just don't get paid as much attention, uh, like it's the married women who have, who lead the conversation and listen to each other and the, the, um, the other women, the, the single women are sort of kept on the sidelines. And uh, my uh, a reader said to me, how did you know? And I said, really, is it still like that? And she said, yes, when I go to a dinner party um, on my own, I always feel like I'm not paid as much attention to, like the married women get more, um, more chance to talk. And I thought, wow, I had no idea that it was still that bad. But I do think that we, we still have that imprint of the traditional path is that a woman will uh, find a, a, a partner and marry and have a family. And, and that's, you know, it's not as strong an imprint as it used to be, but I think the ghost of it is still there, is still very um, much part of the background. I think, I think the financial liberation of women is, is the, the most important change. And without that, you know, nothing, nothing could follow. Um, I mean, up until the 70s, women couldn't even get a mortgage without a male guarantor. And that, I mean, that's relatively recent. Um, so in the, you know, in, in the period we're writing about, especially in the 30s, when, you, you know, um, Violet is really dependent on the good graces of her brother to just to just to survive, even though she's working. Um, it, it just it just made marriage such an important decision for a woman that, you know, marrying the right person was so key to her survival and happiness. You can see why yeah. that the marriage plot was was the the kind of story that the novelist, the domestic novelist wrote, because it was it was the biggest decision a woman would make. And it was the difference between being happiness and absolute misery, because mm. you had no other independence except what your husband was prepared to grant you. Um, and that really didn't change until until women were able to earn their own money and keep it and buy, you know, and get mortgages and bank accounts and that sort of thing. So all that all that came kind of post 60s, really. Um, and I think I think that's equally as important as as the, you know, the contraceptive pill as a sort of social driver of, of change for women, really. Mm. And um, I think both, both our books really do sort of t take on that subject of, of how how women are supposed to manage without without a sort of welfare state and without a husband. Um, it's you, you know they are really thrown on the good graces of others in in my in my book it's the uncle there's a there's a a, fr a good uncle who is the guarantor for the mortgage and there's um and you know tops up their money when they need it and and it, you know in in tracy's book it's the brother who who is the you know the fallback and has you know has to be kept on side because because she's got no one else mm -hmm. Which, as you say, yeah. is there's not much of a change from the the period of Jane Austen was writing about. Mm. A, absolutely, and it, you do. I think you do both bring out the precarious nature of the existence of, of both of both um, of, of, of these women. But having said that, I mean, you also have married women in the stories, uh, and their lives maybe not a complete bed of roses either because again um i was struck by the the societal expectations on them in a different kind of a way um both um um uh, it was um gretchen in um in your book claire and of course um it was violet's sister-in-law um in uh, a single thread uh very beautifully turned out women, incredibly smart, sort of giving this impression of, uh, of, of a perfect family in a perfect home. Um, and I was really interested in the way that you had, uh, whilst contrasting them, I suppose, with the, uh, the idea of, of, the, of these, these single women, the surplus women, actually, you made them pretty sympathetic as well. So did you have some sympathy with the situation that, that they, they were in as well? 
Yes, I, I, yeah, I, I mean, don't my, think, um, my, I don't think women necessarily had it that, yeah, go ahead, sorry. No, after you. No, <laughs> I think women <laughs> didn't have it um, easy whatever ways. They were, they were uh, lacking, even in a marriage, there's, um, they're lacking power. And, it, and as Claire said, it's financial power. So they're, mm. they're always dependent on someone else. And I think that that can really limit uh, the scope of a woman's life. Mm. Claire, do you? I think I tried to, um, I tried to show the sort of, the, the gap between the, the ideal and the reality by interspersing my chapters with these sort of handy household hints <laughs> from the 1950s, which were the things that Jean, that was Jean's job on the paper was to edit this sort of page of household hints for women. And these were all genuine um, tips that I found in, in my local 1950s parish magazine. And they're absolutely outlandish in, in their sort of thriftiness and invention. But th these are sort of, interspersed in the chapters to to kind of reflect on the great difference between the the ideal of of the sort of wife and the actual the reality of of it and and how how grim it must have been really to to be to have those expectations of you when you're completely unsuited for it mm. um so that that was how i sort of drew attention to the to the that sort of mismatch between um appearance and reality I was fascinated by uh, both Claire and, and my character's obsession with clothes and food, particularly food. It was, you know, how to eat well with very little money. And I'm not sure either of our characters really ate particularly well, did they? They were always, uh, for Violet, the, the biggest treat when she managed to negotiate herself a pay rise, <laughs> rather difficult pay rise. The, the way she celebrated was by going out and having a hot, hot lunch, a hot meal with three courses, because that was the way, you know, because she was so hungry because mm -hmm. her salary was, was so little. And, and also just the, you know, not being able to buy new clothes and always have to, having to make and mend and all of that. You really nailed that with, with Jean as well. Yes, I, I liked it. I, yeah, the, I really enjoyed it, the food. Yes, I, I, I spotted that as a common theme and, uh, and, and winced slightly because I can, I can remember even uh, not, well, when I was small, my grandparents were still eating some of the things that you were talking about. Mm -hmm. And I thought if I'd had to survive on that, it would have been, would have been very tricky. Um, so having kind of uh, sort of expressed the view, I suppose, that um, the, the, the duty fell very heavily onto those unmarried daughters in terms of uh, society's expectations. Um, do you feel that, that we've maybe gone too far the other way towards personal fulfillment now and that there isn't enough of a, a sense of duty within families because it is so very different from the stories that you describe? Claire, what, what would you say about that? Um, I, I slightly feel I slightly feel that the that individualism has kind of run run riot over over previous um, generations' notion of duty and and kind of conscience and what their what what you know what their their family is owed in terms of their their allegiance and mm. and um, that was part that was something I was trying to sort of explore is what to to what extent can could you know what can be expected of the individual as in terms of sacrifice what level of sacrifice can can we expect um in order to keep society running smoothly and i think now um we, we we've almost come to the point where we we feel that the that, that no sacrifice is really is really appropriate for people to make in order to keep society mm -hmm. running smoothly and that the the individual's self-actualization and and um the, the quest for full for personal fulfillment is almost the, the the um the main goal and and society has to sort of look after itself um and I, i'm not qu i'm not quite sure where i stand really on it i mean i i feel i feel obviously we're very fortunate we're very fortunate to live now um and to have those choice choices about sort of education and working and things but at the same time, I feel that the, when I when I write or read characters who who are are sort of noble and dutiful, 
I, I sort of feel there's something rather wonderful about that and, and admirable. Um, you know, you, the, the, the character of, of Arthur in, in Tracy's book is a sort of exemplar of that. And, and um, to a certain extent, Howard in Small Pleasures are, are sort of, they, um, they expect to, to be dutiful. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I, sort of, I sort of feel kind of slightly nostalgic for that. <laughs> <laughs> yes that mindset but on the other hand there is a, a feeling um too that it's uh the, the the sacrifice that the the women make um for that to, to be dutiful is that something we're willing to do now and i you know i think if you use the example of looking after older parents very few um very few people are willing to do that now um, and I don't know if this is a good, bad, or indifferent thing. It's, it just says what it says about society, that we prefer our older parents to live on their own uh, or in a care home rather than having um, one of us stay at home with them is, uh, is, a, is a really, um, uh, there's, no, there's no right or wrong answer to that. But I think that you're right, Nicola, bringing up this idea that we have privileged the individual in a way, or in, in that particular situation. On the other hand, what often happens too for women in particular, is that the woman, um, we're, we're now in to be able to do everything. So we are what they call the sandwich generation. We're, we have kids, we're often having kids slightly older, and then we have older parent um, who needs help. And so we're split between the two and we're trying to have career. And something often has to give because it's very hard to do all of those things. Mm. So I'm not sure that's an ideal scenario either. Um, but it's interesting because in a single thread, Violet, um, uh, well, <laughs> what's really, I found very funny is that uh, we both, Claire and I both had the, our mothers, our difficult mothers, get sick and have to go to hospital and ruin the opportunity for our heroines to have a, a date of sorts with, um, with or, or go out with the, the men there. I mean, I just, when I read it, I actually emailed Claire and said, I can't believe it. Your mom's <laughs> ill. The mom's ill. It's fine, says Mrs. Speedwell. <laughs> but when, when Violet has to drop everything and goes and looks after her mother, and then she and her brother have this conversation about what to do in the future. Because Violet says uh, to her brother, I'm not going to come home and live with her permanently. I've got a life. I've made a life. And he's like, how can you do that to your mother, to our mother? And she says something like, You're in, or she thinks something like, nobody ever asks Tom to drop everything and live with his mother. It's only me. Why is it the men never get asked this? The men, you know, they're seen going off and having their career and they're not, nobody judges them for not dropping everything and looking after uh, their mother. Is it, why is that? Is it because they're men? Is it because they, that they have dependents themselves because he has a wife and children have to look after. So he can't be expected to. It's, it's a really complicated uh, situation, and I, I don't know what the answer is to it, but I think, um, I think that women are the, are, tend to be the people who, um, who, who get the worst of that deal. We get judged, and we also have a lot of work. We, we end up doing too much. Mm -hmm. so, I think yeah. also that, I mean, this, this social change from, the, from, from being the, you know, the dutiful daughter to the, to um, you know, putting putting the elderly parent in a care home. Of course, we, we reap what we sow because the, the daughters will then will in due course become the mothers who are in the care homes. So it's not as if we've chosen the path of selfishness. We know we know what's coming in the future. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah. um, I just feel sorry for the generation that looked after their their own mothers and then got caught in the in the social change and then and then gets put in the care home like my own mother yeah. um and so they they got the worst of it at each end of life but for future generations we you know we we reap what we sow and uh, <laughs> that's fair enough <laughs> yeah we all know where we're heading <laughs> oh thank you very much that was very really interesting um looking at those the sort of the common themes there uh, moving on to a kind of a more general sort of note um 
I noticed at the beginning you both described yourselves as uh, writing historical fiction or writing historical novels, which I thought was very interesting. Uh, maybe it's my age and I still find it hard to think of books set in the 20th century as being historical. <laughs> but, um, but you're absolutely right, of course. Um, but, but I'm very interested and I'm, I'm sure a lot of other people are. And how you research, because the work I do is a lot a lot earlier uh, in terms of research how do you research an, a, a 20th century setting do you do you think that's different from researching earlier history or are you following similar kind of of principles there Tracy because you've written uh, books yeah. in many different time periods haven't you yes I mean well in, in a way um it's it's obviously easier to research the 20th century because there's so many more sources. So I, you know, I've set books in 15th century France and 17th century Holland, and there's a lot less material that one can draw on for, for, for times like that. But um, the, the, in a way, the opposite, it's an opposite problem, which is there's maybe too much material to draw on in the 20th century. And also people have lived through these times. Um, I actually managed to meet a man in Winchester and interview him who had grown up in the 30s. So he's very old. He had grown up in the 30s um, in Winchester and could describe vividly all the cafes he and the, and the dance, the dance bands he had danced to and what the names of the cinemas were and where things were and what was the good side of town, what was the bad side of town. And uh, it was, but, and that was the first time I'd ever written anything historical that I felt I, you know, I, that people were, could read it and sort of go, oh, no, it wasn't like that at all. And I always admire contemporary mm -hmm. writers because, uh, you know, if you write a contemporary novel, say, set in London, where I live, the, um, I have my, my very strong view of what London life is like. And it's probably very different from what I'm going to read. And I don't always agree with it. If I read, it. I don't think, I might think it's not like that at all. And or it's like, you know, it, it rubs against my own personal experience. Whereas when, I, when, when somebody reads a historical novel, they haven't lived in that time. So they just have to trust the writer. And, um, and that makes it, uh, it it's, a, it's a big responsibility. And, um, but I love the research because I think uh, it, what I have to do every day when I sit down to write is kind of create this world around me that's very different from what I'm living in. And, and, and then write about it in a way that um, convinces you, the reader, that I know what I'm talking about, that I, that I lived it, even though I didn't live it. So um, to get that, uh, that sense in the 19, for the 1930s was, was actually kind of a joy because you could read, and I'm sure you did this, Claire, I could tell that you, you read, you immersed yourself in 1950s newspapers from that period, which of course you would because you're, your character is a journalist, so you, you needed to, especially local newspapers, and getting just amazing snippets out of those. Um, and I, I look through 1930s magazines, women's magazines, women's manuals, newspapers from the time, and you pick up so much just from the ads in the paper. Like what people, what are they, what are they trying to tempt people to buy at that time? And just stuff like that I found, and you know, what were they eating? I just found the food fascinating. Um, so unappealing most of the time and um, but just lots of so there's a lot of fun but but it also was it's much closer to how we live than say writing about 17th century holland so um i'm i'm aware of it being you know readers judging it in a different way so that um that had its own added pressure and also for me claire wouldn't have had this because she'd been wrote it in the set it in the 50s but my character is, uh, this book is set between the wars and it is 1932 to 34. We know that they're about to go through another war, but they don't know that. And, uh, and to try to, I had to kind of hold back on that, you know, right in the middle of the book, Hitler becomes chancellor of Germany. And one character, Arthur, is, is more switched on than others, but he was the only one I could allow to be He'd be able to be the Cassandra about this and go, uh, well, I think something might happen because everybody else was oblivious. And it was so painful having to let them be oblivious because they've, they've suffered so much from World War I. And to know that, the, for me and the reader, to know that they're about to embark on World War II is just unbearable, really. 
at least you your your characters Claire had already been through it all yeah yeah that I mean my my characters had a different uh, going in a different sort of way they they didn't know that the 60s that the sexual revolution was coming sure. and so we we know and so it's kind of very poignant that they're that they're stuck just before it yeah. you know with, with all that implies but they they don't know it they think that they're modern of course you, your own characters feel that they're at the absolute yes. cutting edge of everything um yes and the, the other thing i found when when researching um and and sort of writing about a time that i i hadn't lived through myself was also the idea that although you might be setting it in the 50s it's no use looking at 50s fashion and 50s furnishings because unless you're the sort of people you're writing about are super fashionable which mine aren't they're obviously going to be living with the furnishings of the 30s or or, or you know they're, they're going to be having their their parents hand-me-downs and their parents furniture so pe people are generally you know um living living with the with the trappings of the previous generation as well as their own and you know That's so that was something to kind of yeah. um factor in um which which i sort of it took me a while to get my head around that and then of course the other thing is having to leave everything out having done all this research and then not using it because obviously you you can't just you can't you can't describe anything in a in a historical novel that you wouldn't describe in a contemporary novel i mean that's kind of the rule that you would never say right. he he picked up his aluminium and glass iphone if you were writing a contemporary novel and therefore you wouldn't you wouldn't discuss the, the <laughs> composition of the landline phone of the 1950s just because you happen to know what it's made of you, you just have to leave out everything that you know if if you wouldn't have put it in a contemporary novel you just can't put it in your historical novel so it's it's having to be so sparing with all this lovely research yeah. that you've done that's that's um <laughs> challenge but you need to have that don't you there in order to create that Mm. That, that, because the, the richness of, of, of the worlds that you create in both yeah. of these books wouldn't yeah, be like that absolutely if it wasn't for having that that underpinning I suppose mm. but there's some very really useful if there's any um, aspiring historical authors out there this this had some very useful tips there I think um, and I'm, I'm go I've made a note of the thing about um, fashionable clothes and furniture as well to bear that in mind uh, so thank you very much mm. um, I'm aware that uh, we're, we're at times ticking along and I have two uh, slightly less serious questions that I wanted to ask you before I open it up to uh, inviting questions from from everybody else uh, one of them is um, I'd really like to know what are your small pleasures because I love the concept of small pleasures so much the idea of Jean sitting down and enjoying her cigarette and that was just you know a bit of peace for her and a, a quiet moment um, and and I think maybe especially at the moment, um, we, can, we can all take solace from, um, from small pleasures. So I just rather nosily wanted to know what, what you would say yours were. Glad you want to go for that. Um, well, I'm, I'm, a bit like, I'm a bit like Jean. Jean's got a drawer of, of things that are too precious ever to be used. You know, little, <laughs> little bits of stationery and um, <clears throat> little soaps and bits, you know, cosmetics that she just keeps in a drawer and sort of gloats over. And I'm a bit of a gloater myself. I, I've got the sort of thing about pristine notebooks. I like a little notebook, but I hate writing in it because it immediately spoils it. So um, that, that sort of thing. Yeah, I, I've got, I'm a bit of a hoarder of little, little things that mustn't be touched, little bars of soap that you, you wouldn't want to use because that spoils it, or a little candle that you, you never light because it would be spoiled. Um, so I think they are, that's a sort of a slight kind of, uh, um, neurosis of mine but um <laughs> but the, but the possessing of them is what gives you the pleasure not the using them that's, that's really that's really interesting <laughs> thank you for sharing that uh, and tracy what about you i i hate to say it but my my internet went down and then came back up and oh, i missed right. the question so just to, if you repeat the, the question. question sorry uh, the question is uh what what are your small pleasures what uh, uh, <laughs> uh, thinking of the things that at the, uh, at the moment because we all particularly need uh, need small pleasures to keep us going, um, at maybe at, at, at difficult yeah. times like this. So yes, just I, asking. Well, I have a little list of lockdown <laughs> two point well, How am I ready? And I thought I, I went to the my local bookshop today and I bought a jigsaw puzzle. <laughs> 
jigsaw yes. puzzle and a stack, you know, some books to add to the books I haven't read. Um, I have a stack of books I'm going to read. Um, I do yoga. I, uh, I quilt because a few books ago I was, um, uh, I was writing about a uh, 19th century quilter who, who moves to the States and I learned a quilt in order to write the book. Um, and actually I learned to, to embroider in order to write this book too. So I'd, I'd sort of do the on the job training like that research. And, and uh, I still quilt. And actually it was one of the things that was the best part of the first lockdown was um, I, I was very jittery at the first of it, at the beginning of it. I had insomnia and it was just difficult. And, and I thought, I think I need to make something. Um, and surround myself with beauty. And so I, I had these beautiful um, fabrics and my, uh, a friend of mine wanted a quilt made and in blues and greens. And I chose a really simple pattern and I just sat at night with light, low light and listening to music in the living room and just sewed. And it was, you know, creating this very beautiful thing um, was really helped. I haven't finished it yet, so I'm gonna <laughs> take it up again tomorrow, starting tomorrow. But I think it's small things like that. I have to say knitting, having a glass of wine, just not not making it into a big like I've got to do something like learn Italian, which is something I think <laughs> I ought to do. But you know, I think actually having small pleasures is the perfect title. It's it's not it's it's not trying to make this big you know, statement in your life right now. I think you just use this time coming up to focus and uh, on on small of something that's achievable. Mm. Thank you both very much for that. And finally, really very briefly, Hilary Mantel recently said that writing was no fun. Do you agree, <laughs> Claire? What do you think? <laughs> um, it's. Well, it's fun when it's going really well. Um, it's, it, you know, when you've done a good day's work and you finish and you've really, you've broken through some problem or you've written something that you think is particularly fine, then yes, then it's fun. But those, those days are kind of rare. Um, mm -hmm. So I would, I would agree with her and say it's not that much fun. It's not nearly as much fun as reading. I mean, you know, I think most, <laughs> <Yes>. most writers... <laughs> All writers would rather be reading than writing. I always think that, that re reading is like going to a wedding, whereas writing is like hosting a wedding. And there's really no, mm. no comparison in those two experiences. Um, so, it, you know, it, it's, it's fun when it's going well, but, you know, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's so you. seldom does. <laughs> you know what, uh, Claire, I love that. I love that idea of it being like a wedding. And um, the thing is, though, we have all been to weddings that we've been bored at, where the uh, bride and groom are just having the time of their lives because they got all their <laughs> friends around, they're drunk, they're happy, and you're dancing to their favorite music. It may not be our favorite music. So uh, I have to say there are weddings definitely have their longers, especially the photos. Oh, so I think, <laughs> I think they... It's, um, and, and actually, I think that writing can be really a wonderful, I, I, as you said, Claire, when you nail something, it feels really good. And I think that most of the time during a writing day, when I have a writing day, there will become, there'll be one moment, even if it's in amongst all the other stuff I feel I haven't re written very well, there'll be one phrase or one sentence or just one breakthrough with the character. And that's kind of all I need. I, it's very rare I have a day where I've just had a terrible writing day. It usually something comes out of it. Um, but I, I always feel like it's a bit like running. I used to run a bit. Huh. And I, I never really enjoyed it during the time, but I liked the shower afterwards. And I, I sort of feel like the writing, writing, there's usually a few moments of sparkiness that are good, but it feels really good when you've had, you've, you've had a, a good writing day. You feel really good afterwards. You feel virtuous. You feel right. I'm going to do it again tomorrow. And that's the thing I think that is so hard is keeping up the momentum. And in this day and age, when we're so distracted by other things and we have other demands on our time, family and other stuff we're doing. And to, to sort of sit down and write every day, that's what I think is, the, is, is hard to do. And, and it, that's what feels good is when you've had like 
five writing days in a row when you really feel like you've 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 moved on in that week to you know if you write a thousand words a day you've written five thousand words you manage to do it every day and you look back and go god my characters have come from here and they're already over here and that's a really good feeling the cumulative effect of it well thank you both very much indeed i will open it up now to uh questions from our audience so i think uh, vicky's going to come back um uh, and and uh, let people uh, put their hands up if they uh, would like to ask uh, a question so thank you very much indeed yeah um if you'd like to ask a question if you can use the reactions button at the bottom of your um screen Um, Carol, I think we can send them into silence. Oh, good, we have it. <laughs> We've got Carol here. <laughs> Hi, thank you very much for a fascinating talk. Um, from all of you, I, it's a question for Tracy, please. Mm -hmm. I just wondered with um, the theme being the embroidery, if you had deliberately chosen to name your heroine after two small, very delicate flowers. Violet Speedwell. I, Violet Speedwell. Yes, I, um, I, I started with, with Violet. I knew that I wanted that to be her name. Um, it, it felt like the right period uh, uh, name and it just felt, it felt right. And then I thought, what's her last name going to be? And I had all various other names. And I, I find names are very important to me. They're very evocative and I have to get them right. And um, I didn't know, I, I was thinking of different names and I didn't, nothing seemed to work. And I asked my husband for, you know, a good, a, what would be an interesting um, English name that, that sort of is describing something. So I, I have a very good friend whose last name is Elderkin. And I just think it's that kind of English name. I really love that kind of Anglo-Saxon feel. And, and that is like two different words put together, but I didn't want to use her last name. So I asked my husband and he said, well, I once worked for two women, worked with two women, and their names were Pippa Midwinter and Venus Speedwell. And I went, wow, those are the best names ever. And I said, Speedwell, I'll have that because it's, it feels right. The mouthfeel of, of Violet Speedwell is right. And also it means two different purple flowers. So I, uh, I definitely felt and I just wondered, Claire, did you have um, any, do you have any feeling about names? Because names can be very important. Um, yeah, I, I get massively hung up and waste hours and hours trying to get a name, even for a really minor character who's going to be just come and go. Yeah. And it, it takes, it, it takes an awful long time. And because I've worked in, in schools as well for, for years, I, I keep kind of accidentally or, or kind of subconsciously stealing really good names from school registers and then thinking oh I shouldn't really do this because you know <laughs> but but some names are just too good not to use um but I've, I'm I'm terrible I've, I've inadvertently in one of my books used my mother's cousin's name almost unchanged without realizing it I'd obviously just internalized this name as a child and thought what a, what a nice name and it had just surfaced and, and I thought I'd invented it and my mum didn't really say anything until long after the book was published and then she said yes why did you use my why did you use my cousin Jane's name and I just I was sort of horrified that I'd done this without her without her correcting me but anyway um that so yeah I, I do I I you know names are massively important in in mm. books and um, I'm sort of drawn to drawn to writers who use quite exotic names. Like Iris Murdoch's a great one for crazy names, and I, I'm always sort of drawn to that kind of writer. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Excellent pleasure. Um, if any other questions, if you'd like to use your um, reactions button. And say while uh, people are having a think about that I was going to say I'd like to ask you a question Nicola what what is your um guilty or your small pleasure oh <laughs> yes that's funny isn't it I having thought about asking everybody else that I hadn't really thought about that myself 
Oh gosh. Um, well, it could be a chocolate eclair. That... <laughs> We're back to the food team again, I think. Um, yeah. Yes. And, and, and fortunate, fortunately with chocolate eclairs, of course, they're small enough that you don't feel kind of um, that one, one is perfectly acceptable. It would only be if I was sort of having several that uh, I think a lot of my small pleasures are associated with food um, and eating, along with the other things that people have mentioned as well, the reading um, and the, uh, which isn't really that small a pleasure, is it, when you think about it? Um, we too have um, invested in a few jigsaws as well for uh, for the next uh, for our next phase of, of, of lockdown. That's definitely a, a pleasure. So uh, yes, I share I share those uh, as I say, along with the chocolate. <laughs> Brilliant. Any other questions? I'll say decidedly quiet this evening <laughs> <laughs> well i'd like to then say thank you ladies it's been a wonderful evening and thank you for taking part obviously all of the books are available um, through your local independent bookshops and uh, many of those are delivering them to people's homes um, and via the post throughout the current or the new about to happen lockdown um, so you can still get your hands on the books if you haven't got them already um, ladies i was going to say what are your current projects for the future nicola do you want to start with that one uh yeah oh, thank you Clara. very much <laughs> <laughs> okay uh, yes i um I'm just starting i have another book coming out um next summer uh which i'm finishing the revisions to at the moment I say finishing who knows <laughs> how long that it's going to take to revise but that's set in um that that's the earliest I've gone and that's set in uh, around in the period of the wars of the roses so uh, just around the turn of the uh, 16th century um so I'm, I'm working on that and at the same time I'm um, plotting out what's going to planning what's going to happen in the next one which is uh, set in the years uh, before the gunpowder plot so um, that, that's that's what I'm working on at the moment my hands are, are full with that uh, so I, I'm quite enjoying the that new book feeling the, the the starting the new book the bit before you actually have to commit yourself by doing the writing so uh, yes yeah, so that's where I am at the moment. Tracy? I am writing a book that's set um, in uh, in Venice, um, and which is, it breaks my heart that I'm not actually able to go there to do research at the moment, because one of the points of choosing a place like Venice is so that you can go a lot, but hopefully I'll make <laughs> up for that when things improve. Um, it's about Venetian glass, and particularly beads that were made um, for centuries and used as trade all over the world. So it's about a family of glass makers, uh, following them from the 15th century to the 21st century. And so going back in time quite a bit as well. Mm. Yeah. Excellent. And Claire, do you have any new projects? In um, I'm, I'm in a bit of a gap year at the moment. Um, it's sort of extending into a gap longer than a year, but I'm just <laughs> at the stage of the sort of tortured stage of thinking about something new and just kind of hanging up a few ideas in my head and seeing what sticks to them. And I'm just, I'm just starting to get that sort of slight tingle of, of interest in an, in an idea. Um, and I'm just going to see how, see how that develops. I, I'm, I'm really very slow and uh, sporadic and I don't, I don't write that many books. Um, I, it takes me ages to think of something that, that I really want to do. And I, I get very nervous when I'm about to commit to something that it's not going to work. So I, I have to be absolutely sure that's what I want to do for the next few years. So I'm just hoping that this, that this slight sort of tingly feeling actually kind of develops into a plot. But we'll see. Well, your hesitance um, certainly worked with, uh, <laughs> with small pleasures coming out yes. and the success that it's had. Um, after having not produced a book for a while. So, um, yeah, hopefully this, you know, pregnant pause, as it were, um, will um, help you then in the future and create another fantastic novel. 
Well, thank you, everybody. Thank you ever so much for taking part. Um, we've got another event coming up on the 18th of November, which is the Christmas Fiction Book, which is with Sue Moorcroft and Joe Thomas and uh, the Festival's own Sammy Ashby. Um, thank you, everybody, for taking part. And um, it will be available on YouTube over the next few weeks. <laughs>